tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Oh, my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. Oh, my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms about me and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Luke 21, verse 5 is where I'd like to begin. We covered this last week, but let's begin here again for context. Luke 21, verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts... Remember last week we preached how the disciples were infatuated with the pretty building, the, the beautiful stones in the temple, right? Jesus gives them a somewhat soft rebuke here, but then it launches into a whole other topic. Look at Luke 21, verse 6. Jesus says, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus points to the, the, the temporal nature, temporal nature of this earth and the temporal and the vain nature of the things that man builds with our hands. Standing right in front of them, of course, was Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, the savior of the world, the chief cornerstone himself. But they marveled at the work of men's hands instead of God. Well, Jesus is going to launch into a sermon here, a topic. We know that this conversation is going to lead him up to the Mount of Olives, and he delivers what's called the, um, the Olivet Discourse. It's a very, it's a long sermon about the end times. And specifically, it addresses the fall of Jerusalem all the way to the end times. Look at verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master... But when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? The disciples want to know when is Jerusalem going to fall? When will one stone be upon another stone? But the question was even broader than this. We know this from Matthew. Matthew 24, verse 3, tells us that the question, just let me read it for you. The question also included this. It says, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So this question from the disciples that takes them to the Mount of Olives was a very broad question, right? When will Jerusalem fall? 
When will the end of the world be? What signs will we see? So remember that this chapter that we're going to look at, Luke 21, and the parallel chapters, Matthew 24, it's a very important passage speaking of end times things. And it will mention things that have happened, and it will mention things that are yet to come. We'll know this from what we read and from other passages of Scripture. This chapter 21, over the next few weeks, we'll be covering it. These signs of the times that Christ talks about. First, we'll be covering this section from verses 8 to verses 19. Verse 19, I should say. Today, we will cover where Christ takes this conversation, which, which is the signs of the end times, the final days, the end of the world. What signs will we see? Big topic, isn't it? But there's one specific thing I want to draw out, and we'll get to that, and that'll be the heart of our message. But let's look at Luke chapter 21 and verse 8. Christ is going to jump not here to the temple, but toward the end times, the end days, the end of the world. 8. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. Christ is going to give us some signs of the end of the world. This isn't the fall of Jerusalem, that happened. But this is the end of the world. And this first sign, he says, in the end times, there's going to be deceivers. Deceivers who don't just come in his name and say, I'm of Christ, but who actually say they are Christ. They are Christ. It's a marvel, isn't it? Over the history of our world, we've had some people that have claimed to be this Messiah, returning Christ, etc., etc. Much of it, though, has happened in pockets of our world, like in Africa or other continents. And it's never been very widespread of, oh, wow, look, there is Christ. I believe days are coming when this will happen. I don't know if it has anything to do with AI technology, but if you think about that, it can get kind of scary a little bit to think about the new technology in our world today and what it might replicate and what people might say, whoa, it's amazing and worship it in such a way. If people were excited about rocks on buildings, people might get very carried away with what AI might produce. But that's all speculation. Christ, though, says deceivers will come, and they're gonna, they're gonna say, that they are Christ, saying, I am Christ. Says not, says, don't go after them. I was trying to think today, where do we see this kind of starting a pretend version of Christ, a knockoff version of Christ, a false Christ, but truly proclaiming to be Christ. And you may think this is silly, but I do not think it is. And I actually think it's very fitting for our sermon today. I think there's a chief place you see a knockoff version of Christ today. And some 408 million people are watching this knockoff version of Christ. Well, where am I speaking of? In the show The Chosen. The show The Chosen. It's, to me, this is the best example of Christ being claimed that I am Christ. Of course, the writer's going to say, oh, it's just a movie. This is just, this is just you know, creative writing. But people watch this and people express to me again and again, well, this is how I got introduced to Christ. This is how I learned of Christ. From a TV show that's putting words inside Christ's mouth and often words that contradict what Christ actually said. Yet he is so popular in the chosen. If you understand anything about scripture, you should already understand there is a great contradiction there. Christ is not a popular figure in this world, yet in that show's portrayal of Christ, he is immensely popular, immensely lovable, likable, everything he says. I just want to consume this. This made me fall in love with Christ, someone told me. I love the way the show presents it, but between the, the music and the backstory and all these little creative flares, I'm falling in love with Christ. Beware we don't follow a false Christ. The Christ that is real is the Christ of Scripture, not some dramatized, made-up version conceived by truly unsaved men. 
chosen. If you just want to just stop, I know this already rubs a lot of the world wrong, a lot of Christians wrong, this little point right here. I would submit to you, I would submit to you, have firm reservation about watching that show. Why? Well, just the simple notion here that the Bible tells us in Proverbs, don't add to God's words, right? Lest they'll be found a liar, it goes on to say. That's in, in Proverbs um, um, uh, 16. No, excuse me. It's in the book of Proverbs chapter 12, I believe. The Bible says not to add to his words. Yet this show adds to Christ's words again and again and again and again, and we're all just supposed to consume it as artistic license. Right there, just stop. Don't watch it. The Bible says here, there will be deceivers that come in His name. That come in His name. Many false Christs. That passage, excuse me, now I remember, it's Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6. Don't add to Christ's words. Last week I spoke of Taylor Swift, of all people, and her following of some 140,000 people going to her concert. Popular. This show has 400 million views. 400 million views. Is this a great revival of Jesus Christ? Or is it a different Christ? Is it a secular Jesus? You need to be wary of this because the days are coming when this is what will happen. People come and say, I am Christ, and they do it in a way that's pleasing for all. I will show you this morning, if you haven't met Christ before in Scripture, I will show you who Christ is. And He's not a well-beloved character in this world. Why do people like this secular Jesus? Why do people like this dramatized Jesus? Why? Why? I'll give you a good reason, and we'll preach on it this morning. Because this secular Jesus does not rebuke them of sin. This secular Jesus accepts their sin. You can see it in show after show. He tells them it's okay. It's a false Jesus. You can find false Christians in our world today by how they approach sin. Please look at verse 9. Other signs of the times... 9. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. We do have such signs existing today. Wars and rumors of wars with Russia and Ukraine and Taiwan and China. Seems like we're on the precipice of something every other day. Look at verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. There have already been 15 earthquakes this year of a magnitude of seven or greater on pace for a record as far as large earthquakes go. You read some articles and they love to say, no, there's no increase in, uh, in that activity. Yes, there is. Earthquakes are increasing as Christ predicted. Famines in a world with all this technology, all this production, we still from time to time experience food shortages. And some say you could experience more. Food prices climb, droughts, global warming. By the way, God made global warming. The world has been cyclical over all the centuries. Heating and cooling. Well, it is getting hotter in many ways, and this will... This could bring famines, pestilences. We just enjoyed something called COVID-19, a pestilence. But who knows what will be next? Pestilence and what will happen when such things come. Look at verse 12. But before all these, before you get to these so very serious signs, sure signs, you're going to see something else. 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and to prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Talking about this persecution. Yes, Christians have faced persecution over every century. It's very true. But true, severe persecution is on its way. 
It says, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. We don't need to fret about this. God will get us through such times if they come in our lifetime. God will see us through. He'll give us answers. So we don't need to fret. But it's a sign of the times. Look at verse 16. Another sign. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Where does this betrayal come in the end times? From the homes. Those close to you betraying you. Friends, family, parents. Turning on you over your faith. Look at verse 17. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Signs of the times. You can look to seismic activity and geopolitical events across our world. You can also look to your home. Betrayal that's happening now between believers and rejectors of God's word. You can see what's happening in our society as those who still want to stand on this old book become more and more shunned, more and more unacceptable in polite company, if you can call it polite company. You should be hated of all men for my name's sake, and there shall not an hair of your head perish, and in your patience possess ye your souls. As the scriptures always have, there's great consolation and comfort. We'll be okay. We'll be just fine. We've got the captain on our side, Jesus Christ, who's already overcome the world. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear but God himself. So we don't need to worry about these things. We just simply, as Christ provides signs of the times, we can be wary. We can be sober about what's going on. I want to focus then this sermon because I'm not going to give you a doomsday go out and buy beans and rice sermon. We'll be talking about prophetic things over these weeks, but I want to give you some very practical things that you can consider and apply in your life. But I want us to accomplish this first one. I want us to digest verse 17. Look at it again. And you should be hated of all men for my name's sake. I think there is so much to learn in that thought. Christians, as time goes on, will be hated of all men. You see, just in that verse alone, some of the contradiction I'm having with the show The Chosen. Right? Millions and millions of people are loving it. Is it really Christ? Is it really Christ? But you in your life, I ask you this, the way you live, how are you ferried in this world? How are you faring? Christians, as time, especially as time increases, will be hated by this world. And I'll tell you why, I'll tell you how, I'll tell you what it means, I'll tell you what it means if it's not happening. Let's look at our Bibles to Luke uh, chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, covered earlier in our Luke series. We're just preaching through Luke. Whatever passage God leads us to that morning, that's what we preach. This morning's sermon is about being hated of all men. What does it mean? What does it mean? Luke 6 is where I'd like to draw your attention. Inside this chapter, it's, it's, it shows the Beatitudes, if you've heard that word before, the blessed way to live. There are, there's, there's much to learn in this passage. Talks about loving our neighbors. Talks about even loving your enemies. We know the scriptures are quite clear that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Right? We're, we're to strive to dwell peaceably with all men. We know Christians are to walk meekly in this earth. We know all these things, right? And we're trying to live this way. So then it stands the reason to ask, why will we be hated? If Christians are supposed to be these meek, loving, right, humble people, and we are, why will Christians be hated? Keep thinking about that. We'll come back to that again and again. Look here in Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Now, why would they do that? You're loving. You're meek. You're turning the other cheek. You're going the extra mile. But people don't want to hang out with you. Why? Why? 
in, in this preacher's mind. I, sh I still struggle with this sometimes because I'm naive and I, I love people and I truly, a fault of mine is I love to please people. I'll be honest, I love to please people. Um, and it's a, to a fault, to a fault. So I struggle sometimes with why, why do these people not even want to be with me, hang out or ever stop by my church or ever see me at my house or why do they never want to talk? Why? Why do they separate me from their company? Maybe you're experiencing this too. Maybe you're experiencing it too. Maybe with your friends or family. Why? Let's put our finger on this why. Sometimes you go around wondering if you've taken enough showers or if it's a personal hygiene problem. I don't know. Maybe that is my case. I'm not sure. Look at 23. Oh, at the end of that verse, so 22. And cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. It's a spiritual thing we'll get to. It's a spiritual thing. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. You see, this has happened before. People come to this world. They preach truth. They preach God's word. They live Christ-like, and they get rejected. It's happened before. It's happened before. Only today in this world is, is Christianity presented as this thing that it should be well-received by 400 million people. If you're living right... You'll make even your enemies dwell at peace with you. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Look at 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Uh, please understand this, and I feel like I've already got too many thoughts on the burners this morning, but please understand this very simple thing. The Bible says, woe unto you when all men shall speak well unto you. Now, now, woe means to stop. Woe means to wake up. Woe means to say, you're doing this whole thing all wrong. Your job is to not go into this world and become a friend of the world, right? Your job is not to go into this world and have all men like you, love you. You're going to go into the world and be kind. You're going to go into the world and be loving. You're going to the world and be meek. But there's something about you that's going to be off-putting. What is that something about you that's going to be off-putting, where they're not going to speak well of you? You could be the best, the hardest working person ever, the nicest neighbor ever, the most loving grandma or aunt or uncle ever, but they're not going to want to be around you, no company with you. They're not going to speak well of you. Why? Why? I'm not going to answer it directly yet. I'm going to keep thinking about this. Why? What is it about Christians that is so off-putting? Some Christians seem to be doing okay. Just dramatize your life like the chosen. You're going to be, you're going to be loved in this world. Just, get some, you know, just walk around and have a nice soundtrack playing all the time and just speak smooth things. You'll be accepted. Look at John 15. Why are Christians rejected? John 15. Say, Logan, you're naive. You're not being rejected. Christians aren't rejected. But you need to wake up, stop, smell the roses, read the scriptures. John 15, I believe the words of Christ. Look at John 15, verse 18. There is a sound rebuke here, truly, of Christians who find their place in this world and aren't rejected by this world. There's a sound rebuke. They're living Christianity all wrong. John 15. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves, but no part are we ever called to love this world. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is Christ. Maybe Christ is paranoid. No, he wasn't paranoid. He was God manifest in the flesh, and they crucified him. They hated him. This is not the God of the chosen here. This is not the Christ of the chosen. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Christians aren't of this world. You want to discern a Christian from a non-Christian? You know, they both may say it. How is the world receiving them? 20. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours also. 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Again, for my name's sake. Persecuting Christians, hating Christians, for Christ's name's sake. 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin 
but now they have no cloak for their sin. All right, now we're getting closer, right? We're getting warmer. Why did they hate Christ? What was his issue? Where did he fail? How come he didn't win all men to love him? How come he didn't win friends and influence people? Why did they hate him? Well, look at verse 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. This is it, my friends. Why was Christ rejected? Because he pulled down the cloaks that were hiding their disgusting, ugly sins. He pulled them down and they knew then that they were naked in their sins, they were naked in their guilt. This is why Christ was not popular. This is why the real Christ wouldn't make a very good TV show. He'd be going around telling people, no, that's wrong, and this is wrong, and that's sin, and you're guilty, and you're guilty, and you're guilty, and all of it would be what? Then pointing to what he's about to do, die on the cross for their sins. That's why you get to that great crescendo of Christ dying, because he's built, he's built all the reason why he's going to die. And then it matters that he sheds his blood on that cross to pay for the penalty for their sins. Then it matters, then it matters, then it matters. But it doesn't matter if you haven't done the work to say you're guilty in your sin. But people say, oh, I got saved watching The Chosen. Yeah, you never realize you're a sinner. You didn't get saved. The Bible is very clearly, the Bible says, repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Repentance means you acknowledge that you are a sinner. You say, yeah, that hits me. You got me. The cloak's down. I'm guilty. I need a Savior. Sin. Rebuking the world of sin. This is the answer. Christians who actually preach God's word that says sin is wrong, it's still wrong, are, will not be popular. You can say, well, maybe that's not my calling. It is your calling. It is your calling. I'll prove it to you. Before we're done, I'll prove it to you. But they hated Christ because he spoke of and he rebuked their sin. Look at verse 23. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If you hate God's rebuke of, or you hate Christ's rebuke of sin, you hate Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh. You hate God, the Father. 24. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen me and hated both me and my father. But this come at the pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Look at Christ's words. They hated me without a cause. He did nothing wrong. He was a good neighbor. He was a meek man. He was a servant of men as he walked this earth. They hated him without a cause. So friends, don't marvel the world hates you. Pray for me. I do struggle with this. I sometimes just forget the scriptures. It's like, why does, this, why does this person hate me? Why does this family hate me? Well, why does this, this, whole, this whole group hates me now? Why? Without a cause. It simply has to do with the simple fact that I've quoted a few scriptures. I still stand on this book. Just the fact that I say I believe this book is off-putting enough. Well, if he believes the book, that means that he's going to say that this is wrong, this thing that he's doing is wrong, or this thing that my daughter's doing is wrong. That's how it works. Standing on the book, which all Christians should be doing, we should get the rejection. It takes mad magician work to hide this. For a Christian to walk, a true Christian to walk through this life and please all people, it takes smoke and mirrors. Well, I believe the book, but there's a lot of great parts and we're not really sure if sin's sin anymore. Well, I believe the book, but God, Jesus died and that means everything's okay now. Smoke and mirrors. And that's how you're, you're living your own, the chosen. <laughs> you're living your own life of making the word of God palatable completely. Oh, I love the way this person's living. I'll follow you. You're not speaking in truth. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. You've hidden God in God's word. The point of this, please don't lose the full picture of this. You are to be a loving person. Love your neighbors yourself. You are to be meek. You are to go the extra mile. You're even to love your enemies. You are, you are, you are, you are. But the fact of the matter is, when you mention God's word, boom, the relationship just exploded. You can try as hard as you, I try. I really do my personal relationships to be the, the kindest person I can be. But then I, I blurt out some, some silly thing like Romans 1 is still true. 
or that divorce remarriage is adultery, or you know, drunkenness is sin, or no, you two shouldn't be shacking up, you need to wait till marriage. Or, or, or no, nakedness is still wrong. That one really hurt me. And in my own family, I'd still say that nakedness is wrong. And that just, whoa, we don't want this guy in any kind of chat group with us. What was that about? It says, look down at verse 26. But when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. I want to think about this now, too, because you have Christ who rebukes sin. You have the Word of God, which makes us all guilty, stops our mouths, right? And then we have this real thing called the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. And the, 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 the job of the Holy Spirit is very clear in Scripture. I want to show it to you. Because I think it's sometimes that this misconception about the Holy Spirit has drug a lot of people down. We think, well, the Holy Spirit is what's going to help me just make everybody like me. No, watch what the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life. Look over at John 16, right across the page. The Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, what will it bring what will it bring? How will it manifest itself in your life? It won't be with tongues. Tongues have ceased. You're not going to prophesy. Prophecies has failed. Ceased. What the Holy Spirit will do in your life as it compels you to live for Jesus, watch what it will do. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. That Comforter is the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Comforter, by the way, is a great comfort for the believer. The Comforter is not a great comforter for unbelievers. I'll show you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You see this? She understand in, in, in God's plan, he had all throughout the Old Testament, he had a thing called the law, which taught people what? That they were wrong. That they'd broken God's rules. It was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, right? The law. And then Christ comes down, and what does he do? He removes the cloak. He says, you're sinners, you're sinners, you're sinners. But then they kill Christ, they reject Christ, and he leaves. And now the world thought, well, now we're going to be off scot-free. No one's going to tell us we're wrong. We can live however we want. But you know, in God's omnipotence and omniscience, you know what he did? He said, no, we're sending down the comforter. You know what the comforter's going to do? Convince people of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, what is the comforter? Where is it? Where is the comforter? Where is the Holy Spirit? This is really the kicker that really ties persecution to us. The Holy Spirit is in believers. Our job and our empowerment through the Holy Spirit is to, look at verse 8, when he will come, he, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Many churches today are, are claiming to be, oh, we're a really Holy Spirit-filled church, a really Holy Spirit-filled pastor who never mentions sin. He is not filled with the Spirit, a different kind of Spirit. This is the Spirit of God. We're proving the world of sin. It's not a spirit-filled church if all they do is praise some shallow knockoff version of Jesus, but they never rebuke sin. It's not a Holy Spirit-filled church. Of sin, because they believe not on me. You see, this idea of rebuking sin has a very real reason. Belief in sin brings this belief in I need a Savior. Belief, when you don't believe in sin, you don't need a savior, you just need a TV show. You need some entertainment, some popcorn. You need someone to, you know, just to help you play basketball better. Someone to get you through a hard time. No, because of sin, you know you need a savior, a redeemer, who shed his blood for your sins. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. The Holy Spirit brings forward this message of sin and of righteousness. We're preaching loud and strong and true that God is perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, has very high standards. We didn't make the cut in our righteousness. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We cannot go about to establish our own righteousness. It's in Christ. 
And then it says of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. You say, Logan, I've been to many, many churches. They don't talk about any of those things hardly. They don't talk about sin. They don't talk about God's righteousness and God's holiness. And they don't talk about judgment. That's for sure. That's off-putting. Hell? Never heard that growing up. Hell, I don't hear that in my pulpits anymore. Why? Because these pulpits aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. These churches don't have the Holy Ghost. God gave this job of removing the cloaks to Christians. And how this plays out? Christians then are persecuted. Christians then are hated of all men. You cannot miss this in Scripture. I'm not making it up. So you plug this into this whole equation. You say, well, Logan, I've been living this life, and actually, everybody seems to like me. Whole family loves me. Community loves me. I'm doing my job, dwelling peaceably with all men. No, what you're doing is a magician's trick. Actually, you're miming. You're, you're, you're miming your life. You never said a word that Christ spoke. Because if you bring forward Christ's words, it will reject you fast. Blessed are you when men shall hate you. The Holy Spirit brings forward these things. Look over. I have a, a wonderful passage in the Old Testament I will get to. But I want to show you some more truth here, or evidence that all what I'm saying is true. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. If we need more evidence, Christ said it word for word how the Christian life would go. We're rejected like he was rejected. Marvel not, the world hates you. Separate you from their company. I think there are many people who would go back to Christ 2,000 years ago and they would try to coach him on how to be more appealing. <laughs> and then they go to all the, the apostles who lost their, their, their heads and were tortured and crucified upside down and they say, well, you know, could have used a different approach. Could have tried a little bit more this way. There are all kinds of books now. I'm, I, of course, I'm a pastor and I list it on my social media, so I always get advertisements for, you know, here's how to grow your con congregation. Here's how to make the Bible more relevant or more appealing, right? Here are sermons that will bring them back another time. <laughs> it's like all these things about what are we trying to do? Make the world love us? I'm serving God. Amen. Not worried about pleasing man. Like all of us should be worried about pleasing God, not man. Right. Obeying God, not man. Look at this. This is our world today. You know 2 Timothy 3, 1. Let's talk, speaking of prophetic things. Look, 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men should be lovers of their own selves. Yeah, we love ourselves so much we've got to find a pastor that just speaks to our spiritual gift and tells us how wonderful we are because we are wonderful. Covetous, we're going to find a church that actually just helps us with our business deals. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is the end times picture. Perilous times. This is what it looks like. Already sounds very familiar to me. But watch verse 5. Having a form of godliness. The end times, people will have a form, a show, a portrayal of godliness. But watch what it says. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. People have this show of godliness, but they don't have the power of Christ's salvation in their lives. The true anointing of the true Holy Spirit that compels them to share Christ and rebuke the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. A form of godliness. That's what you have with the show of the chosen as our example is this morning. A form. Oh, it looks good. looks good. There's no power there. A form of godliness. From such turn away. Look over at verse 10, please. Um, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Look at this life that Paul the Apostle is living. Look, purpose, faith, long-suffering, people love that. Charity, people love that. Patience, people love that. Surely Paul is going to have a successful life. 
a large congregation, a big following, people patting him on the back. Watch, though. Eleven persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. What was the great Paul the Apostle? What was his life? Filled with persecution. Not because he wasn't being a loving person or friendly or kind, but because he spoke God's word unapologetically. The full counsel of God. He called sin, sin. Didn't glaze over it. Look at verse 12. Yea, and all, that means you, all, it should mean you, that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <laughs> it's straightforward, isn't it? So you don't take my word for it. You are supposed to live this life in such a way that persecution falls on yourself. And I'm not telling you to go out and be rude, slash people's tires, knock over their fences. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you to live in such a way this world rejects you. You know what you're going to do? You're going to bring forward God's word. Prayerfully, lovingly, but unapologetically bring forward God's word. You're going to call sin, sin. You're going to call God righteous. You're going to say there are consequences for rejecting this message. Rejecting Christ. And you will suffer persecution. And by the way, like it has happened for years and years and years, true Christians who suffer persecution are living this life the way Christ intended it to be, the way the Holy Spirit guided it to be. We have great fellowship together. It's the Christian who, well, they're both saved. You've got two people who are saved. But one is living their faith. And one is hiding their faith, trying to please this world. The fellowship between these two is very rocky. Very, two very different directions. One's like, wow, uh, they call me wise. And we're called foolish in this world, right? Strong, and they call us weak in this world. What life are you living? What life are you living? Are you suffering persecution, as the Bible says will happen, especially as the end times grow near? It says in verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. A whole bunch of fakers out there. You don't need to live like them. You don't need to preach a false Jesus. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of, them thou, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know the problem with living a life of trying to please people and trying to be accepted by this world? You know what a major problem is? You'll lose your kids in the process. You can't live a life trying to please God and please people. You'll lose those you love in that pursuit of acceptance of this ungodly world. If we as Christians are trying to receive acceptance from the world, our kids see it, our loved ones see it, and they're like, oh, the world is that important, huh? Well, I can, I can make the world like me too. I'll join in this path and this path and this sin and I'll live like they live and they'll accept me too. Dad, aren't you proud of me? Yes, son, you did well. You, you learned how to dwell peaceably with all men. No, son, you failed because I failed. I forgot what mattered. What mattered was God's truth being spoken, not being hidden. Not me being liked, but God being known. That's what mattered. All Scripture tells us all Scripture, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's why people hate the Bible. People say they like the Bible. Our world says they like the Bible. But you just do some research. Look over the decades. You'll see that the amount of Scripture read in services in our, in our world is just declining at a precipitous rate. Not so much Scripture at churches anymore, is it? There's PowerPoint presentations with one verse and some knockoff version, right? But not a lot of Scripture. People don't know Scripture. I, I was talking to an older um, uh, man, uh, and he knows Scripture. A lot of older folks know Scripture. They memorize it. They study Scripture. That's falling off so fast. You're lucky if you'll meet a teenager today who, who, who even knows John 3.16. As I witnessed the doors, I for years have always said, now we both know this one. You, both, you know John 3.16. It's usually been true, but lately it's not. They've never heard, for God so loved the world, in John 3.16. They've never heard it. People have dropped the Bibles, hidden the Bibles. Why? Because the Bible stops our mouths. It reproves us. It corrects us. It instructs us. That's why it's wonderful for some and hated for others. The Bible will make you very unpopular. The Bible will make you hated. So you know the best way to live your life? 
Do you want accepted from men? Don't touch the Bible. Don't carry a Bible. Don't quote a Bible. The world will love you. The world will love you. Nothing there that's off-putting. Proverbs 16, 7 is that verse. Just let me read it for you. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. How can that verse exist and this sermon today be true? When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. How can that verse exist? Did, did Christ mess up? Should, should he have had everybody pleased with him? Did Paul mess up? Are true Christians today messing up? The truth is, that it's in that word, when a man's ways please the Lord. Right? He maketh even his enemies to be at peace. In your decisions, in your personal decisions, in your personal words, you should seek peace with others. Like you're arguing with your sister about what TV show to watch. Just make peace. You're arguing with your neighbor about where the boundary is. Just make peace, okay? But when you bring forward God's words, you preach them. You preach them strong and true. Because they are true. And if that ruins the relationship with your sister or your neighbor, so be it. Please turn in your Bibles over to chapter 4, real quickly. You don't have to turn there probably. Look at 4, verse 1. 2 Timothy 4, 1. I charge thee... Thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing as, and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. You know what that means. That means preach the Bible when it's popular and when it's not popular. The Bible's not popular today, so preach it. Don't change it, preach it. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What will happen if you live this out? What will happen? You're going to be rejected of men. You will be. But I'll tell you what, you're going to give someone a fighting chance to repent and ask Christ to save them. You're going to give someone a fighting chance to get right with God. You're going to live a life of meaning, of purpose. Not just shallow live. Let's all just live in the mud puddle and accept each other. Christianity. With all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Our world is going to go to what pleases them. They want to be pleased. They want their ears tickled. This will happen in your life. I, I, I hate to say this, but in my life, I think I've seen it where I have spoken. And then I've been rejected by a person or a group. And then that group becomes tighter now because uh, they tickle each other's ears. Well, you're not like that guy that we kicked out of our, our family circle. Yeah, he was very judgmental. He said my nakedness was wrong. How dare he? Speak truth. Bear your cross. Bear your cross. Prayerfully bring forward truth in this world. I want to show you a story to, Lord willing, put all this together. This is our last story. It's in 1 Kings 22. Hey, Logan, this is not the sermon I wanted today. I wanted something uplifting. Well, Christ is the one that started bringing up the end times. And he gave you a big sign about the end times. Christians are going to keep standing, keep standing, keep standing, and they're going to be rejected. And this should happen everywhere, and it should happen in your life. Don't avoid it. Just accept it. Walk through it. Bear your cross. Don't seek to find your life. You'll actually lose it. Look at 1 Kings 22. I want to show you a story so we can put all these verses we've read. Uh, an example. I think it'll mean something for us before we're done. Look at 1 Kings 22 and verse 1. This is the story of Ahab, Jehoshaphat, and Micaiah. Look at 1 Kings 22 and verse 1. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. They want to take this land back from Syria. 
and the king of Judah and the king of Israel. They're talking about this. Let's take this land back. Four. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. This guy is going to win friends. He's a very nice guy, right? Anything you need, you got it. I'll go the extra mile. Right? Whatever you need, I'm here for you. Good. Good. But watch this important question the next man asks. It's a good question. Five. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. I guess in this passage, it's not formed as a question. It's formed as a, as a recommendation. Let's ask God if this is right. Let's ask God if going to fight this battle is right or wrong. That's a good friend, isn't it? Be a good friend. You in your lives right now, you may have a friend who wants to do something. It's not rude for you to say, okay, let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. If they're a very shallow person, they'll take offense at that right there. What? You're questioning that I didn't already pray about it? You're questioning my judgment? People, we're very thin-skinned, aren't we? <laughs> now to recommend prayer is an insult in the day's world. Let's pray about it. Is this right, son or daughter, to do this or this, or parents or friends? Should we do this? Let's inquire of the Lord. Now watch verse 6. The king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men. This is his group of ear ticklers. He's heaped to himself 400 people who tell him what he wants to hear. This is like he's got, he's got 400 DVDs of the chosen just lined up. These, are, these really make me feel good. Right. About 400 men and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, what do they say? Because they want to dwell peaceably, because they love his soul, because they care about God. They say, go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of, of the king. They're, they're even evoking the Lord's name. Oh, God's in this, you betcha. Yeah. We, we are an affirming people. We're an affirming church. We're an accepting church, right? You see them all across our valley, right? Be accepted here. Be loved here. We accept you here. We're going to hide the truth here, is what it means. <laughs> And affirming, don't have a negative. I told someone once told me that Logan, you just kind of got a, you got a negative ministry. You know, people people are uh, they they love the positive side of things. <laughs> they want me to be one of the four hundred. Some people come here they're so worried. Well, Logan, the church is never going to grow, never going to grow, never going to grow. Is that the goal? Is the goal to gather bodies? This may sound cocky, and it probably is heart of pride right here. But I could fill this church. I promise. I think I could. I think I could. Just speak and never say anything's wrong. I think I could fill this whole section. Because even, friends, you've been with me for years. We've had many come and go. And what is the common denominator about 90% of the time? Sometimes it's just they had a church here or there or they moved away. But the common denominator is, well, that church, you said this was wrong and I don't, I, I don't like that. I got a friend who's in that sin. I got a daughter who's in that sin. And I got an uncle who's in that sin. And that's it. So we put all those people back in the pews. Boom, 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 boom. We fill it. But is that the goal? No! That does nothing for the cause of Christ to tickle people's ears. I do not want to be, and I do not want you to be, one of the 400 prophets. You know why? You'll see at the end it really matters. You'll see at the end what really love is. Truth is love. They say go up. They say God says. Look at 7. And Jehoshaphat said, now Jehoshaphat must know something about this king Ahab. He must know he's a little bit shallow. Because watch what Jehoshaphat is. Just, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Now he's seen this pattern of this king to just look for uh, affirmation, confirmation of what he's already decided. This man, he's pretty good. He said, well, is there someone who really going to tell us the truth? Not just what we want to hear. This is like the person who says, you know, should we keep going to that church that just keeps saying sin's okay? Or should we go somewhere else? We try. That's a good, good friend, isn't it? A good spouse. We like this church. Why do we like this church? Because it's always made us feel good. And therefore, we've never grown. And therefore, we've never changed. And therefore, we're losing our kids and quick. Find someone who's going to tell you the truth. You'll find a real friend. Eight. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. Now get this. But I, read it for me, hate him. <laughs> There's one guy. There's one guy who will tell us the truth, but I hate him. There's that one church that we could go to here in the LCV. I know there's a church, but I hate it. 
There's that one Christian, that one relative I have in my family, who I know they would tell me the straight stuff, they wouldn't hold back, but I hate them. I hate them. Don't invite them over for dinner. Don't talk. Don't even mention this to them. All right? There's this drama going on in our family. Don't even mention it to that person because we know they're going to tell us the truth. <laughs> As if the truth is the enemy. As if the truth speaker is the enemy. It's not. Truth is best. Truth is reality. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Yeah. Micaiah, like Jesus, like John the Baptist, like Paul the Apostle, like Peter, James, you name it, had a negative ministry of telling people that we are not good. We're all sinners. None righteous, no, not one. And that, no, our sin is still wrong. Even after we're saved, it's still, our sin is still wrong. <laughs> still shouldn't do it. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Don't say that. I, I like this Jehoshaphat. I'm not sure how great a guy he was. Not too great, but he's at least right on this. So don't say that. Still believe in truth being best. Don't follow your heart, Ahab. It'll mislead you. Look at 9. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten thither, or hither, Micaiah the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. So that's still going on. They still got the 400 just tickling their ears. Watch this guy. 11, and Zedekiah, the son of Kenna, made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, with these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. What, about a, what a great dramatization. There's a false prophet with a false message, but he zooped it up. He's got props. He maybe had a soundtrack in the back. This guy really made this whole worship experience just incredible. My heart started thumping when I saw the horns come out, and I really felt it. It really made the whole thing come alive to me. But it's all based on nothing, a lie, a falsehood. Well, the chosen really made the scriptures come alive to me. No, there's no scriptures there. You're just watching a movie. Just watch Braveheart. Fast forward the naked part. It'd be a lot better. A lot better. It's a production this man has. This false prophet. A production. People are wowed by productions, by stones. The horns come out. Why are you going to drive them? This guy needs to write a book. It would sell today. How to win friends and influence people. How to grow a congregation. How to tickle people's ears and make a good living out of it. Make a killing off of it. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up the Ramoth Gilead and prosper. How about that? Everybody's saying this. The majority says this. What are you talking about? Majority is always right. Right? The majority of people believe. Well, whatever. You pick the topic. The majority of people believe that divorce, remarriage is not adultery. That's the exact opposite of what Christ said. I'm going with Christ on this one. The majority are thinking that there might be another, I hope it's not bad yet, but it's leading this way, multiple other genders. One day we'll get to that point in this world. You know that? The majority will one day say, well, actually we think, though, there's, there's more than just the two. The majority will get there. The majority is not right. The majority is rarely right on this earth. The majority, though, they all say, go up and prosper. Now look at 13. This is good. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, behold. Now look at this nice messenger. This guy's, this guy's a friend of Micaiah. He says, and the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. He's saying there's already a consensus. The 400 prophets are all unified that this is a good decision, that this is a good move. God is for it. Now watch what he says. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. This is his friend. He's looking out for Micaiah. He wants what's best for Micaiah. He says, Micaiah, you make the right move here, you'll be right in with the other 400. You'll be right there at lockstep. You'll be successful. You might be as good as the guy with the horns pretty soon. You just keep working on your trade here. This, and this friend wants what's best for Micaiah. Do you understand this is a bad friend? He might love Micaiah, but he does not understand the fear of the Lord. He doesn't understand and doesn't value truth. He wants the acceptance of this world. Sometimes we have friends like this. 
Well, that church would grow a lot better if you did this. The family would like you a lot more if you did this. That is not the goal. Let us serve the Lord with our lives. Let us preach the full counsel of God from our lips. And Micaiah said, watch, he says it better than I ever could. 14, and Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Let our lives just dwell on that verse. Let our lives live that verse. What God says, I'll believe it, I'll speak it. So he came to the king. And the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? <laughs> I'll meet some people like this in life sometimes. Just walk up to me. So, you think this is right or is wrong? And I can already tell in their mind they know what the answer is. And they already know in their mind what I'm going to say. And there's already an adversarial relationship. And I haven't said a word yet. It's because they're fighting Almighty God. They're kicking against the pricks. So there's already animosity between me and somebody I've never talked to. You've probably experienced this too, right? It's almost comical. It's almost laughable. They're fighting with God and God's truth, and they're mad at you. We're going to go up or forbear. And he answered him. Now watch Micaiah. I, I want to shake this man's hand one day. And, and he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Is there ever time for satire in ministry? I think there is. Because it's laughable. My guy is like, I know what all the other guys said. I know what you want to hear. Do you want me to be like everybody else? I can do it. I can do it. Watch. He says, Ahab, there's a gift in you. You are a wonderful budding, blossoming flower that God loves, and you're going to love on other people, and you're going to do powerful things up there at Ramoth Gilead. God bless you, my child. Go in peace, right? Really work it up. My guy's like, I can play that game. If that's what you want, I can play the game. I can get along with my friends and family who have chosen the way of the world over the way of God. We could do it, we could do it, we could do it. But Micaiah says, no, that's not me. I'm dedicated to God. What God says, I'll say. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to apologize for it. He's sarcastic. Verse 16, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, here's the truth. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return everyone to his house in peace. What Micaiah sees is a big picture about what's to happen. He sees the whole world scattered, all the land, the country scattered. He sees this as a terrible mistake that's going to impact other people's lives, scatter other people's lives, ruin other people's lives. And therein is why we should understand the value of truth, should we not? You see, you speaking truth isn't about you building a name for yourself, checking a box. There's a whole lot of love in that thought of speaking truth. When you, when you, when you tell your family, I'll, just, I'll use the, the, the silly example I've already mentioned. When you tell your family that nakedness is still wrong, like I did a year or so ago, and, and get rejected in certain forums, nakedness is still wrong. What you do is you speak truth. And you get the family to put some clothes back on. So you get consequences that, that don't happen with the young people later on consequences that come from living naked in a naked world in a perverted society you see there's love and the families don't scatter we don't lose the children to the world we come back to the bible truth there's all kinds of reason to preach truth loving reason loving is not for my kai to say hey you know what for just like the 400 i think you're going to do well it's, it's the opposite of love. When you hide the scriptures, when you call sin okay, or just don't mention the topic at all because you don't want to ruffle feathers, you are going to stand before God one day and he'll say you were a scatterer and not a gatherer. Many Christians today, Paulist Christians, are living these lives. You look great, you look wonderful, but you're not gathering, you're scattering because you won't mention the truth that you know is true. Lord, help us. He says it's going to have dire consequences. This action you're about to take is not God's will. Look, please, at verse 24. 
This guy comes back. This false prophet comes back because Micaiah tells this whole story about these people lying. And, and 24, but Zedekiah, the son of Kenna, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? Vicious. This false prophet is vicious, isn't he? Some of those most vicious people are the people who pretend to stand on God's word and are really making a killing at it. They hate truth speakers. They hate truth speakers. Some of these churches today, they'll never judge, they'll never judge anything except for an outspoken Christian with God's word in their hand. Then they'll say, you stop that. You stop judging people. Stop hating people. Here... This man smites the true prophet, smites the man who told the real truth, smites the man who really loved Ahab and the other people in the nation. 25, And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back into Am and the governor of the city, and to Joash the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison. Just like every other saint worth his salt, he's in prison. Think about Paul, right? Stephen stoned. He's in prison. And feed him with the bread of affliction, with the water of affliction, until I come in peace. This is what happens. Persecution from speaking truth. From speaking truth. The, the nominal, the shallow, the chosen, loving Christian today will say something like, Well, don't you see, Logan, he ruined his ministry. He could have kept on preaching, but now he can't from prison. Same with Paul. He could have kept on preaching, but now he couldn't from prison. Same with Christ. Now he can't because he got crucified. Y you, Lord, give me love. I'm sorry. You're wrong. Love is to speak the truth no matter the consequences. Love is to speak the truth no matter the consequences to you. 28, and Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. We're, we're, we're done right here in this passage. Look down at verse um, 29. Um, I'll read you this story. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. They go. They listened to false counsel and go. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle. But put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. You see, they're going to disobey God, but they know there might be some danger in disobeying God, so they're going to do it carefully and they're going to disguise themselves so they're not, they don't look like kings. This king of Israel. But the king of Syria com commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. They want to kill this king. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. Yeah, some friend that was end up being, wasn't it? They put the Jehoshaphat in the kingly apparel. They're chasing him. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. There's a whole message in there in itself, isn't it? He, puts, he makes sure Jehoshaphat looks like a king, but he disguised himself to look not like a king. Some friend. You know, this world has a lot of fair-weather friends, doesn't it? They don't really care about you. They care about their own skin. 34, and a certain man drew a bow at, adventure, at a venture. Just pulled a bow and arrow back and let it fly. And who did that arrow hit? And smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said to the driver of the chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Just an arrow, just up in the air at a venture, hits this king Ahab. His undoing. The Bible says, Be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says you reap what you sow. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. So let us tell people that transgression is wrong. Let us tell people that the wrong way is wrong. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even, and the blood ran out of the wound in the midst of the chariot. He dies. Soon in verse 38, the dogs lick up his blood, and they wash his arm according to the word of the Lord which he spake. He dies. Life and death. The Bible says, I set before you life and death, therefore choose life. And Christians are to be this one speaking these things into people's lives. 
that there are consequences for actions. The Bible says whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So you define those sins, all these sins. You tell people this is wrong, has consequences. Ultimately, it'll land you in hell, absolutely, but, but unsaved friend, Christian friend, it'll ruin your life as well. Disobeying God always brings destruction. Always brings destruction in this life. But where's Micaiah? He's in prison. Where's Micaiah? He was hated. He was persecuted. Where are you in your life? Have you molded your life into one of the 400 prophets? Doing good for nobody? Truly seeing people scattered around you, your friends and family? Truly in years to come seeing death, destruction? Stop blending in for safety. It doesn't work out. Ramifications fall. Who really loved people in this story? Micaiah. Who hated people? The false prophets. Telling people what they want to hear. Who will you be? The loved or the hated? The truth speaker or the truth hider? Who was Christ? Truth speaker. Hated, persecuted. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. If that's you, you're living life all wrong. Let's pray. Lord, give us the courage, the faith, the trust in your holy word to be truth speakers on this earth. Lord, we're not going to be modern day prophets. We're not going to prophesy, but we are going to share the words of this book. All 66 books, Lord. We're going to rightly divide it. Lord, it's going to guide our lives. We're going to value it. We're going to love it. And then we're going to share it with others because we love people, Lord. And, and when we're sharing truth, they're going to count us an enemy, but we're going to keep marching. We're going to keep serving. We're not going to try this world's version of changing God's word and hiding God's word and calling it love. We're not going to call a good way a bad way and a bad way a good way, Lord. Give us the power, the wisdom, and the sheer, clear eyes to understand the difference between true love and false love between hate, Lord, and love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.